pastel pink and blue and yellow and purple and red and orange was scrawled across the sidewalk, making a brilliant rainbow message that read, you are not alone. You are not alone. I was so arrested by the artwork on the pavement that I stopped in my tracks, even though I was trying, I was trying to work off some of those quarantine calories that I've accumulated. But I stopped there and I marveled. You are not alone. My young neighbor just up the street from me is a prophet, and she she inscribed in chalk words of hope that I and others needed to read in this uncertain and scary time. You are not alone. Words that are written between every single verse of the 31,102 verses in the Holy Bible. You are not alone. It's also a foundational promise of our baptism. Peter writing well, well before my young friend, and not writing in chalk, by the way, wanted to give hope to his fearful and unsteady congregation. Writing about the turn of the century, he burst out in almost, almost pastel language. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth, new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, <coughs> Peter's Greek <coughs> is the finest, the most lyrical uh, in the entire New Testament. And if you just read it in English, you'll see that it flows so easily that you may skip over the power of this passage. First of all, you know this is the only, only place in the New Testament where born again is actually literally given. Born from above, born anew is offered in what? John 3, 5, and 7, in James and in Titus. But born again, uh, Aga. Agonino is only found here, born again. And what's powerful is that Peter is saying that we have been born again into, into something that is death resistant. We've been born again into, into the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is, it is absolutely indefilable. It is unassailable. That's what's happened to us. And us is really an important pronoun for me to drag out here too because the most important part of this passage is, is the pronoun. In his great mercy, uh, he has given us. He has given us, the collective pronoun, new birth. We have all been born again. And here lies the power of this passage and something I really hope that we, will, that we will really take to heart this evening. You know, Peter is writing to a congregation, not too unlike ours here at Christ Church. Uh, it was a time of fear and uncertainty. It was also a time when people, as you can, as you can tell through through the, the letter, people were beginning to kind of doubt whether or not this stuff is really true. I mean, not one of these people in his congregation had ever seen the physical Jesus. They certainly had not seen the resurrected Jesus. And they were beginning to realize they would not uh, experience him, Jesus coming back to earth during their lifetime. That He wouldn't have his glorious second coming during their lifetime. They were beginning to resign themselves to that fact. And finally, and finally, they had all, they had all learned about Jesus from other people, from senior folks in the congregation. Most of them have died. 
And so now their, their faith was wavering a little bit. It's kind of like us in the midst of the scientific revolution. You know, where do we go with it? But even more powerful than that was how they were being assailed by their culture. Um, it was not a culture that was friendly to Christians. I don't mean that people uh, were being taken off to being eaten by the lions so much as, as um, uh, the culture was antagonistic to them. In fact, in many ways, just plain downright discriminatory. And so people began to find themselves pushed to the margins of a society of which they once were, you know, uh, a major part, maybe a player. All these young, all these Christians, young and old, were like Abraham and Sarah. They had heard the call of God and they had left what they knew. They had left where they knew who they were in a certain place. And they and they they and their families went to another place. They began to, to enter another community, another way of life where the future was completely unknown. And there seemed to be some suffering, suffering that was on the horizon, you see. That's, that's what was before them. And so all these people had experienced the same thing. Maybe they had been, uh, maybe they had been a, a, a pretty high muckety-muck in their trade guild. Or, or maybe they had been a government official. Or uh, maybe in the neighborhood, this lady was really highly regarded, but now that they had entered this new community, uh-uh, not so much. And we certainly experience that more and more today. But what kept them, what Peter says, what kept them in this new community was the fact it was forever. It was permanent. It was based on the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was not transitory. You can be in the midst of a job for a while, but then it comes to an end. You can be in a society of, of buddies in high school, but eventually everybody goes their own way. You can be a fraternity or sorority, and you may keep some of those friends into adulthood, but most of that goes away. Everything is transitory except the community of Christ. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, and I hope a lot of our, our young people are watching tonight. To, to enter this new community of, of, of those who've been born anew, those who've been born again, is to become obedient to the Lord of the upside-down kingdom. To become obedient to the Lord of the upside-down kingdom. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we certainly know that Jesus was good at turning things upside down. I mean, the most graphic example is uh, all four Gospels uh, report that when he came to the temple in Jerusalem and he saw they had made it into sort, of a, into sort of a shopping mall, he was overturning the tables, remember? But, but Jesus was always, always turning things upside down. When he, when he looked at the sin that we have institutionalized, when he looked at that, he would call it down with stark honesty. Whichever one of you without sin, rear back and throw the first stone, he said to those who were smug and, and, and thought they were oh so powerful as they encircled someone who's weak and could not speak for herself. Rear back and throw the first stone. He also unseated our... Um, our own personal deception. And we know how good we are at that. By, and he would expose our hypocrisy. Okay? He would expose. And so he would say, he would say something like, those uh, are, who are sick need the physician, not those who imagine that they're well. Saying that to people like you and me, who... Um, Hmm, like to sit back on our heels of our imagined uh, sanctity. But most of all, um, Jesus, the Lord of the upside down kingdom, disarmed, disarmed the insidious hate riven through his world and our world. He disarmed that by an act of personal, sacrificial love. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He says within earshot of those 
who were executing him. Within earshot, Father, forgive them. That's why he's the Lord of the upside down kingdom. And to be part of his kingdom, well, means really for us to turn our world upside down. It means that if we're going to be part of this community, um, we look at sin, of which we're often a part. We look at it headlong. We don't try to ignore it. We know it's there, and we begin to act against it. We no longer look at ourselves as if we're fine just the way we are. Thank you very much. We begin to look at ourselves and see the stagnation and the homeostasis that keeps us from growing and becoming what God has meant us to be. And when we encounter that hate that's laced everywhere, that darkness, we know that it can't be overturned by, by power. It cannot be overturned by more violence. It cannot be overturned by pointing the finger. finger. It cannot be overturned by saying it's the other person's fault. It can only be overturned. It can only be defeated by the way Jesus defeated it. And that is by acts of love and sacrifice. That's it. It's the only medicine that works. Now, I want to be clear about two things. And again, I hope our young people who were preparing for confirmation, they were supposed to be confirmed uh, this Sunday, and it uh, really has, has really uh, touched my heart that they can't be. But maybe... Well, I have no doubt the Lord is using this time to work with you in a more powerful way. But one thing I want to tell you, you did not choose the Lord. He chose you. Um, Jesus says it clearly. I think it's John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Christ has chosen you and me. Uh, and that's exemplified at our baptism. Almost none of us can remember our baptism. Maybe a couple of us can, but most can't. And, some, and, and our parents took us to the font. And after our heads were soaking wet, and maybe we're crying bloody murder, the pastor said, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit at baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. And he would, have, he would have made the sign, or she would have made the sign of the cross and oil on our head, signifying that can't be washed off. And let me say that God has chosen you you can't be unchosen. You can only be chosen. But don't get on your high horse thinking that you made such a wonderful decision for Jesus. No, Jesus made a decision for you. That's a fact. And, and, uh, and he has chosen you to, to be part of his resurrected life. But here's the part that I think often gets, uh, gets misunderstood. And I want our adults and our kids to hear this. Christ may choose us. He does choose us to save us. But we have to choose to be active part of his, of his upside-down kingdom. We have to choose to do that. I'm going to tell you there's far too much spectator Christianity. People looking from the stands and saying, oh, isn't that wonderful? That is not full participation in the body. We've been asked to be in there. We've been asked to be put on the playing field. We're actually part of bringing about a world of justice, a, a world of love, a, love that's, a, a world that's honest. That's what we've been called into. And that is a powerful call. We're not called to be voyeurs of the spiritual life. That decision, that decision lies with you and me. Will we do it or will we not? A big decision is before us. You know, I was speaking to a, a new friend of mine, a senior member of the congregation, just this week, uh, just yesterday as a matter of fact, and he said something to me profound. He said, you know, Pat, I believe that this time of COVID-19 will be a revelation to all of us Christians. He says, what we're going to realize is, and what we're coming to realize is that this disease knows no boundaries. People are getting sick everywhere. And therefore, I believe it will become, it will become a prophecy to all of us so that rather, rather than arming ourselves to the teeth, 
rather than pointing the finger at the bad guy, we will begin to stretch out across those boundaries and truly act as Christ ambassadors. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. The choice, the choice before us is that we can hang back in the, in the shadows, the gray shadows of self-aggrandizement, self-entertainment, self-satisfaction. But life is gray there. We can step out and live underneath the rainbow banner and be a herald to the world. Christ lives. And you, you are not alone.